welcome back to this week's mike Up, where we're talking about the smuggling into the church of sodomy under all kinds of sneaky covers. Catholics need to come to a very quick awakening, however rude it may be, that a major, major behind the scenes player in the destruction of the faith in the West is the homosexual and homosexual friendly cleric, deacon, priest, bishops, cardinals. They are numerous and their destructive power is increasing as society becomes more and more accepting of and indifferent to the evil of sodomy. More and more frequently, they are beginning to reveal their goals in public, which is a watershed moment the Catholics need to take note of. Congressman Bob Dornan on last week's Miked Up went public with the information that the former bishop of the Diocese of Orange County, California, Todd Brown, said to him one time that gay men make the best priests. Imagine that. This week, a startling, take-your-breath-away kind of item appeared in Catholic circles that you won't hear in the Church of Nice media, the establishment media, that there is an official video, official video circulating among American Jesuits counseling them how to be a good gay Jesuit priest. It's being circulated under the cover of preventing child abuse, but actually has nothing to do with sexual or child abuse. Nonetheless, as Rahm Emanuel, Obama's former chief of staff, once said, never let a good crisis go to waste. So the sex abuse crisis is being given various, is given various religious orders the excuse to pretend they're talking about that topic when the real topic is advancing homosexuality. Just like many gay pastors in numerous parishes pretend that they want to treat parishioners with same-sex attraction with charity and understanding, when in reality, they are just opening the doors to get the parish to accept sodomy. What is being foisted on unsuspecting Catholics by homosexual Catholic clergy is the proposition that homosexuality is nothing more than a different but equal expression of sexuality, a different type of love but every bit as deserving of acceptance and welcoming. The world has already welcomed this notion, at least in the West, and this makes the job of faithful Catholics even more difficult because of traitorous Catholic clergy who keep pointing to the world as the justification for their own sick prejudices. We must never forget that all this publicizing of open gayness, the parades, the LGBT ministries, it's all a type of confession and outward admittance of a deeply wounded psyche that needs to experience an absolution in the form of acceptance of their evil. Despite the many confessions of the sin, it can never be absolved by the church until the sin is rejected, until a firm purpose of amendment to change is made. As long as homosexual bishops, priests, pastors, ministries continue to push the idea that it is not a sin, active homosexuality, no absolution can come. And that's the word from Church Milton, mic'd up. This week, we'd like to bring in now into this discussion, we have a wonderful show for you, a great big wonderful show, lots of guests talking about all kinds of things. We're introducing Christine Niles again. Christine, how are you? Michael, good. And Matt Pearson, both on staff here, executive producer, producer guys. We have been studying this. We, Matt, you and I were in Rome with uh, Charlie. We ran into this juggernaut, you know, head on there at the midterm Relatio. Uh, Christine, you've been following this stuff for years. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean... What, what's going on in the church right now with regard to all this? Well, the comment I've made a couple times, I think it was a couple months ago, the last time I, we were talking about this in more detail, is you know, growing up, I never imagined that sodomy, homosexual activity in this, in this regard, is really the one thing that's changing the world, you know, and it's in a destructive way, and we're starting to see that come out more and more, you know, the whole, uh, you know, homosexual crisis within the church, which blew up into the pedophilia scandal, which was really, as we know, is just a homosexual priest abuse scandal. Um, And it's really been incredible for me to kind of experience this education of how destructive this force really is within the church. Yeah, Christine, it's it's not not just a question of the activity, but there's this kind of, this is my identity thing, whether I'm doing something or not, right? Yeah, there's, there's a real push for the normalization of homosexuality throughout the world, and it's happening within the church now, too. I think right at the outset, we need to make something clear. Um, and this might get the new homophiles very angry, but, you know, uh, we have this idea, and a lot of Catholics do, too, that there are two um, equal 
and valid orientations that exist. There's the homosexual, the heterosexual orientation, and then there's a homosexual orientation, that they both coexist as valid and legitimate. That is not the case. That's not Catholic theology. There's only one rightly ordered orientation, and that is the heterosexual orientation. Any deviation from that is just that. It's a deviation. It is disordered, and it could be anything. It could be homosexuality. It could be pedophilia. It could be bestiality. It could be polyamory. Whatever it might be, it is disordered. The list is endless. Yeah. There is one rightly ordered orientation. I think that's the problem that a lot of these new homophiles have a problem with, and, and Austin's going to go into, into that and that's a little it. bit. And we're going yeah. to bring in now Austin Roos. Austin, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Oh, thank, thank you for coming on. This is... Uh, uh, you know, I think Matt and Christine did a good job here of summing up the situation that, you know, sodomy is driving everything in the world now. And Chris, to Christine's point, it's just become an accepted notion that, you know, this is this orientation is is its own orientation. And, you know, if you want to be a good Catholic, you just remain chaste. But you know what? I'm gay, proud and celibate. And you got something to say about that, don't you? Well, I've been following this issue of uh, so-called gay celibate Catholics for about a year now after I noticed uh, uh, this odd thing that I noticed at first things is they were running these columns by people who identify themselves that way. And there, there was a real commonality in their argument. And they appeared to me to be a school of thought, which I named the new homophiles in a series of columns for crisis magazine. Um, and uh, yeah, they're very smart, very articulate. Uh, group of uh, graduate students or, or PhDs who are developing uh, a new teaching for the church. And that is that uh, their homosexuality is a gift from God, that uh, this is a gift that they give back to the church, um, that they have particular spiritual gifts that the rest of us don't have, and they want all of this to be recognized by the church. And you and I and Matt and Charlie running the show right now, we're sitting in Rome when that made it into a, it wasn't finally accepted, but it was an official document. It was the midterm relatio, that famous Bruno Forte, Archbishop Bruno Forte, homosexuals have gifts and qualities to bring to the church. And there it was. So this has worked its way straight up to the very top of the church. Well, you know, it was very interesting that that appeared in the relatio because I was, when I wasn't sitting with you, I was sitting with Bob Royal, uh, you know, my longtime friend, uh, who's a member of my board, founder of the Catholic Thing website. And he was not terribly interested in engaging these new homophile arguments a year ago uh, because he thought that it was a tempest in a teapot, that these, that these people you know, were largely unknown. They weren't going to gain an audience. But after after their stuff appeared in the Relatio, he said, yeah, maybe this is something we need to engage. <laughs> it yeah. really was amazing that a, a central idea of the new homophiles appeared in the Relatio. And, and I would I, and you can comment on this. It, it seemed that that portion of it was the thing that drew the most questions from the press conference on the day that the, the relatio was presented. I would yeah. say that that portion is the one that did the most damage because media outlets everywhere reported that now the church is going to change its teachings you know, towards homosexuality. And if anybody yeah. wonders at all about what the danger of the new homophiles is, all you have to do is look at the midterm relatio. I mean, it was like the shot heard around the world. Everybody started to think we're going to change our teachings on homosexuality. And yeah, so it's very dangerous. The media definitely had every firework in place, and they were just waiting for that spark to find it somewhere in those writings that they could go. I mean, even if it wouldn't have been even as clear as Bruno Forte went and did it as with the directly saying homosexuals have gifts and qualities. Even if it would have been more subtle than that, the media still would have ran with it like it was the church's new doctrine. So, yeah. you know, and I was so grateful that day that uh, that Michael asked the question, you know, what are these gifts? And as I recall, Bruno Forte did not really have an answer. It was a, it was a, it was a very question. ontological yeah. question. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Let me ask you if you now listen. You've gotten in all kinds of hot water here with what you know we lovingly term the Church of Nice crowd, the blogosterium of uh, people who are attacking you because you're mean. You know they yeah. meanly attack you for being mean. I, we'll we'll get into the philosophical stupidity and, of that yeah. later, but <laughs> what. Why do you well, why know, do you think I, this I argument? Uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, as a response to the appearance of two of the new homophiles in a beautiful piece in the Washington Post style section, it was Eve Tushnet and Josh Gonerman um, being featured in in the style section of the Washington Post 
uh, talking about this great new thing of, you know, chaste gay Catholics and isn't it all exciting? And, uh, you know, I, I poked a little fun at uh, the fact that uh, Gonerman was there in his stocking feet and uh, Tushnet was there in her bare feet. And I was sitting there, <laughs> I, I wondered about this. So that Washington Post photographer is coming over and they're hanging around Josh's apartment or Eve's apartment. And, you know, let's say that he's got his shoes kicked off and she's got her shoes kicked off and, and they have a conversation. You know, the photographer's coming. Should we put our shoes on? On the other hand, they might have had their shoes on and they said, you know what, let's be all, you know, funky and let's take our shoes off. I mean, it, it was, having stocking feet or bare feet in a photo session with a Washington Post reporter is a considered act. And, I, and so I made a little fun of the fact that this was a considered act and it was a little weird. <laughs> well, I think, I think it's an obvious thing. I mean, like, you know, when people do things out of the norm, like you point out in, that, uh, in the picture, it, it's a lack of, they don't understand, they're not comfortable with who they are. And it, it, it does, comes off very strange. Well, you know, the thing is, you know, they said that I was being mean because I mentioned Gonerman's dirty socks and Tushnet's bare feet. And, and, and they looked upon that as an opportunity to ignore all the arguments. And so all of a sudden, the whole debate became about tone. I've got a column coming up this Friday uh, on, this, uh, on this particular question of, of, of tone. An argument about tone is for people who are unwilling or unable to engage the arguments. Yeah, that's a yeah. very good point, Austin. We've got about 45 seconds left. Just a quick question for you. Where to from here? I mean, you know, you, you've already got your agenda pushed into the Vatican. There it was in the Relatio. I mean, what's, you know, what's, what's the next fruit they want to grab off the tree? Well, you know, I think that they, they, they want uh, to get their message back in that document. As you know, that was largely taken out. Uh, but Tushnet's book came out. It's getting a lot of press. It's getting a lot of friendly press. But one of the good things is going on right now is that people who are better on this particular issue than the new homophiles are coming to the fore. Dan Matson, who was in the movie Desire of the Everlasting Hills, is now writing. Uh, Deacon Jim Russell, who's with the Family Life Office in the Archdiocese of St. Louis, is now writing. And, and uh, I think that we're going to see a conference coming up fairly soon uh, that will be a response from more sensible people on this particular question. So the debate is joined. Excellent. And you can bet churchmilitant.tv will be there. <laughs> Excellent. Austin Roos, a uh, brilliant guy, knows all this stuff. Thank you very much for joining us. Austin, we will have you back on the show sometime in the very near future. Any old time. God bless. Thanks, thank guys. you. Thanks, Austin. And Christine, Matthew, thank Absolutely. you very much. Everything very cool. So, all right, that's it. When we come back, we're going to be talking about the link between homosexuality and the culture of death and how the culture is going to hell in a handbasket because, as Matt said earlier, the whole homosexual issue. And we will have Marianne Kreitzer on with us from Catholic Media Coalition. Stick around.